Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Alien Familiar RPG Podcast. I am Clayton. I'm Jordan. Now I'm Elliot. Before we get started, you can find show notes and more at alienfamiliar.com. You can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash alienfamiliar. And if you would like to help us out with supporting the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash alienfamiliarmedia. So if you enjoy our content and would like to help us out with hosting costs, any help you would be able to give us would be greatly appreciated. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, today we are going to be walking down memory lane with some of uh, our favorite characters that we've ever played over the course of our role-playing game careers and uh, time permitting, we'll, we might even get into some of the campaigns um, that we've really enjoyed. And personally, I might talk about a couple of campaigns where I was the GM and I feel like it was probably on par with probably one of the, the greatest campaigns that I've ever run. But um, Elliot, this was your suggestion to do this topic this week. Um, I imagine that if you had this as your topic, you must have had something that you really wanted to uh, to reminisce about. Uh, do you have a character or maybe even just an entire campaign that you had in mind whenever you pitched this idea? No, uh, not necessarily. Yes and no. I mean, I, it, I'm going through the exercise of getting prepared, just like we've been talking off uh, before we started recording. I realize I'm a trash player when it comes to my characters. I, I need to do a better job keeping track of keeping character sheets or something because I've, I've played a ton of really great characters and I've played in a lot of in, uh, great campaigns and I have a lot of memories and I'm, I have a lot to talk about. But actually remembering like specifics about names, apparently I'm terrible. But anywho, yeah, the, the first one that came to mind was... Uh, you know, first of all, I think we, we the last few pods we've done, we, we've done a really we've really done a deep dive into the nuts and bolts of of the gaming. But I think looking back on why we role play and and the good times we've had around the table, I just it's just all comes back to just really in if you have a character that you really enjoy to play, it creates all the anticipation, uh, and and that's the re that's really what keeps me coming back is just enjoying. Uh, seeing where the the characters uh, are going to go, where I can take my character. Talking about DMs first of all, DMs make help make good characters because they give you permission, right? Um, there was a game that was run by a friend of mine uh, several years ago, and uh, it was the first time I started role playing again for decades. And uh, I made this character named Aldous, and I was big into Lovecraft at the time. It was going to be a D and D game, and I came at him with this crazy character concept where I was uh, a, a Massachusetts paranormal investigator kind of in the vein of like a Lovecraft story and that my character was from I'll say Boston but uh, I'd heard about a, uh, a I'd heard about a uh, an occult site so I went and explored this uh, this uh, cultist room or this this investigate these cultists and follow them down into like some weird portal and then next thing i know i'm being i'm waking up in this fantasy world and so i played aldous was a an average uh you know 1920s 1930s era bostonian big into baseball um you know wore you know just typical you know three-piece suits kind of like from a detective novel and uh he found himself in this, it was, I think it, the world he ran in was based off Final Fantasy, but it was your classic, uh, it was your classic fantasy world. And playing, having to, the opportunity to play someone from our, you know, kind of adjacent to our timeline in a fantasy world, which just was full of all kinds of great shenanigans. I, I, I was big into, my character was big into baseball. So every time we would go to a town and we had downtime, I would teach, I would get a bunch of kids together and I would teach them baseball. And so over time in his game, baseball became a thing that instead of me like teaching it to the kids, we would show up in towns or revisit towns. There'd be baseball leagues that have, you know, formed. Uh, when I was in combat, my armor was modeled after a, a catcher's outfit. So like I wore, I, I fashioned like a, a catcher's outfit and like the mask and all that stuff. And I fought with a baseball bat. It was good fun. The guy was a warlock too. So he, that was the character's uh, class. So I just really enjoyed that. Alas, he he was the first casualty. I think he died at, I think he died at 
uh, level seven or eight, but then I replaced him with another character I'll talk about later, but I'll let somebody else uh, take a turn. What's, what's, what's your most memorable, Clayton? Oh man, my most memorable. Um, usually I would say the most recent character that I have really deep dived into has been, uh, is usually my favorite. So in this case, it's definitely Wade the Wizard, um, having played out his character arc from very low level to actually reaching high level. And, uh, in the Curse of Strahd game, actually seeing the character evolve and seeing the character evolve in, um, in a way that I didn't exactly anticipate, but I was still able to keep um, the goals that I originally had for the character, but kind of evolving those to meet the um, the way that the campaign ended up going is probably why he's currently one of my favorite characters I've ever played. Aww. And, like, this is another character who was a, um, although he was named Wade the Wizard, he was a warlock. Um, I've, I've talked about him on the podcast before, so I won't go into too excruciating of detail. But, um, I think that the main reason why I had so much fun with him was because I got to play off the other characters in the game. Um, he was, while he was definitely an ally to the other people in the group, there were many things that we we kind we butt head, butted heads against uh, different ideas that um, whenever we came to a problem, the solution that my character came up with was antithetical to the types of characters that the other players were playing. So there was always a fun bit of banter where we got to. Um, basically talk through why, uh, this, uh, why this idea was not actually a very good idea to, uh, to promote our characters as the heroes of the realm. Yeah. I mean, it's probably, I'd say recency bias a little bit, but I'll take it. I, that was all the players I felt put a lot of time and, and energy into thinking of their character concepts. Uh, I, I really, Wade's one of the, the best characters that I've had in a game that I've ran. For sure. I, I would also say that um, another reason why he was one of my favorites is I was able to really get into the mannerisms and the ways th in which he spoke that it really like I, at the beginning of the game, I had a very definite idea of where my influences for like his speech pattern and just his um, his cadence was a lot of fun also. And um just over the course of the campaign, I feel like I, I feel like I really nailed down his particular accent and made it something that was, that was as much a part of his character and something that, um, that I just enjoyed playing every single time I got the opportunity to speak in his voice. Yeah. I love how you, uh, you, you changed my mind on accents. I usually feel like accents or something. I definitely avoid them. I don't choose to bring them on. But in that case, um, and I think that even for Aldous, I, I, I did use the Bostonian. I, I definitely talk with a little bit of an accent, like I was from Massachusetts. And it, uh, but it, I, I think that I eventually just dropped it. <laughs> I, I respect your sticking with it. But Jordan, what, where are you at on here? I'm, I'm curious. You've got, I know that I've played in a million games with you. I'm curious who you're going to pull out of the hat. Favorite character? I don't have a favorite character. The first one that came to mind when I was making this list, though, is the first character that I played in a uh, lengthy campaign, and that was a Stormbringer game. And I, I played this guy. Uh, there's this weird little race in the Young Kingdoms called the Mirren, and they're they're basically like winged elves kind of dudes. And so I'm played one of those and um over the course of what was it probably like nine months or something um prior to this i i'd played in a handful of second edition games that were you know maybe three or four months tops so this was like a really long running thing um i got to take this character from a, a complete newbie up to like you know, what in D and D terms would probably be like 15th level kind of like badass. Um, 
run an entire arc of like figuring out this character's place in the the cosmic order, you know, picking sides in this eternal struggle between law and chaos, becoming like a champion of law. Um, there's all kinds of cool things that you can get as like, you know, a, a champion of law in this game. You wound up with like these um, metallic wings that look like a archangel from X-Men um, and like weird shit like that, you know, a helmet with a personality that was like hyper intelligent and could like, you know, tell me shit that I was kind of too dumb to know about. But it was like, it, it was my first time realizing how deep you can get into the career of a character that you've come up with. And it's, I, I still have that fucking character sheet somewhere, like, goddamn, uh, <laughs> like, over 20 years later, um, it's somewhere in a binder and the character sketch I did for it and, you know, all that stuff. So, yeah, that's that's one that stuck with me. I don't keep stuff too well but uh, it's it's always a great you know day whenever an old binder or old notebook comes back and you you can find a, a you know a, a, a little slightly yellowed character sheet that takes you back to an old game that happened to me uh six months uh wow well, six or eight months ago um so can here's a question for you guys on your lists or just in the back of your head did you write down any characters that you wish you could have played or could have played more are, any, are all your characters basically characters you have to play for an extended period of time? Or did any make your lists that were just those frustratingly like, oh man, this is a great character. I really can't wait to play it. And it might, ran, might have ran like two or three sessions and was it. I definitely have a couple characters on my list who I really wish that the campaigns had lasted longer or been been able to develop further than what they did. Um, most of the characters on my list are ones from long running campaigns. I, I have very, I only have a couple of characters who I wasn't able to play for very long. I would, I would put compiler on that particular list from Clayton's last, uh, D and D game. Um, it was a, a Warforged character in Eberron in like a specifically urban adventure kind of game. Um, yeah, I had big plans for him. <laughs> he, he was quite literally. Yeah, real, real big plans. And uh, God, that character was fun to play just mechanically. I had no idea that like going round after round and not making a single attack could just make me cackle with glee for like hours on end. It, it was awesome. On my list uh, was a uh, you mentioned Warforged in uh, you know. And this is kind of also a question. I this character uh, I really enjoyed. Uh it was the character that replaced uh my first character that I mentioned. Uh he about halfway through the campaign, uh my character died through sheer personal stupidity. And uh so trying to come up with a replacement idea, I made I decided to make data in a fantasy way. So because the the world had some more forged and had some high technology in its ancient past, I dreamed up that essentially a war forged with the exact same personality and name. I just regrafted the data storyline onto that ancient fantasy world. He just like crawled out of the sand one day and it was fun to model. I, I don't, have you guys ever done that? I've just modeled a character almost identically after just a fictional character you love. Um, but another question is that in this case, the one thing that I, that was always frustrating about this character, cause he was very powerful. He's a wizard and, and it, it was a really, uh, he was really a capable character, but I think I would have enjoyed him even more had he been a starter of the campaign character, because, um, have you guys found that it's hard to get footing in a group? Once your character dies or say you die, retire a character and you come back in, I noticed that the one thing that never really developed at that point was that at that point he was constantly, that character pretty much was in the back seat. He was the, he was the late comer. You know what I mean? Have you guys noticed that it's hard to integrate characters and be satisfied, uh, as a second character? Or has that ever happened to you guys? Oh yeah. You got less skin in the game. You got less history with everybody. You know, there's, there's less, um, 
weight of the storyline propelling you know your decisions and and so on like uh yeah the later it gets in the game the harder it is and uh, there's been a couple times where um i've started a game with a character idea and thought okay let's this is going to be kind of experimental this is a little crazy let's try it out see how it goes i get you know five six sessions in maybe um and I'm like, fuck, this This is going to be terrible to play for the next you know, six to nine months or whatever. Um, so I'm going to bail on this character. And if it's, as as you see it, like, not working out week after week, the, the weight of that decision keeps building on me. And eventually I just have to be like, look, this guy's fucking taken off, whatever. Um, I'm going to introduce this new character and do the best I can to integrated in sometimes it can work but sometimes it's too late there's a there's a narrow window of you know maybe a couple weeks <laughs> that you could recast after that uh, i don't know here i think you have to fill an essential void like if you're in a party that always that didn't quite round itself out because uh, I, repl- I replaced a caster with a, or an arcane caster with an arcane caster it was pretty much i just stepped into the same role so that particular character, as much as I enjoyed him, I loved playing the deadpan, you know, log- hyper-logical. You know, I got a lot of laughs at the table and stuff. He was a fun character to play, and the other players enjoyed him. But when it came to the actual power dynamics in the group, um, it was just kind of like, okay, get up and, you know, it's time to start wiggling your fingers now. Come on, get off the bench. Uh, but I think if you, like, can fill a, a void, that can sometimes be conducive to the party kind of appreciating you more and like letting that character kind of become a peer yeah we could probably do a whole episode on how to introduce a new character midstream we might have already but this is this is definitely a rabbit trail we could go down but I, yeah it, that's the kind of thing you want to talk to the dm about and kind of orchestrate something because you know party walking along talking about oh man isn't that weird that so-and-so just ran off in the middle of the night last night who's this on the horizon Oh, hello, travelers. I'm such and such. Can I join your merry band? <laughs> it's fucking lame. Looking at my list, I only have two characters on my list who were not present in the first session of the campaign, and both of those characters were not present in the first session of the campaign because I myself was not present in the first session. So... And and both characters were literally brought in in the second session of the campaign. I do not have any replacement characters on my list. Well, that speaks volumes. Is that because you haven't had that many replacement characters, Clayton, or that they were just not ones that you particularly gave a fuck about? The replacement characters, just I did not give a fuck. Because I've got a couple of characters on this list that I'm looking at. And they were the pri- they were the initial characters, and they ended up having to leave the campaign either because they got killed or something else happened that took um, took their the character um, out of the campaign. And the replacement characters just did not fit in. And I, it's kind of what you were talking about, where there is a there is a certain time frame where you have you you have the the growing of all of the characters. You're all of the players around the table are developing their characters and finding their voices as the character. And I don't mean literally finding their, the way they're going to talk, but just kind of figuring out who the character is. And if you, in my experience, if you, if you miss out on that window, it's incredibly hard to get that character integrated into the group at a later point. Yeah. There's a weird thing that happens in, uh, in character, like in game time to characters and their like comparative power level, you know, relative to the rest of the world that doesn't ever get narratively acknowledged. But when you're swapping out characters like that, it's, it's like a strange thing. Like, you know, in the space of a couple of months in game time, this character goes from not being able to hit the broad side of a barn with a bow and arrow to being able to shoot an apple out of the sky at 30 yards. And somehow that's just fine. Like nobody else in the world is moving along that, that quickly in their proficiency. But for this little group of people, that's what's going on. And then if you've got this extra person coming in and they're anywhere along that power curve with those people, 
okay, so is this person either on their own crazy, epic, you know, explosive self-actualization journey, or was this guy just a tank for a while, and if you had met this dude three months ago, he would have been a titan compared to you? Like, it's fucking weird, you know? And, like, I don't know. Well, you know, and we we I think we tend to, on this podcast, we, we're constantly nitpicking about fifth edition and stuff like that. But I will say that's something I can hand it to, um, well, D and D, I guess, and the D and D model and the leveling systems is like I found that when I'm playing, none of the characters that I have on my list are from non. Like I've played a lot of D, uh, like say Deadlands and stuff like that, and in World of Darkness, and you know none of those are on my list. And I think it's fun to really feel that power change, and in those games where you start off very you know kind of you're starting off at the higher uh, you know pretty high level of power and the game system itself doesn't actually generously reward you with more power more ability as the game goes on you're not very far at the end of the campaign like in some systems that you were when you started it in in ability i i feel like i don't know i guess i have i'm i'm noticing that i don't attach to them as much i don't know my i think i think my list of very is very representative of the different game systems that i've played my list is very heavy in dungeons and dragons but that's because dungeons and dragons is the game that i most often play i have a couple of other characters from world of darkness and then i've got one apocalyptia character on my list everything else is D &D, and i that's probably pretty representative of the proportion of time that i have spent in as a player in game systems that aren't D D. Yeah, more or less the same for me, except that for some reason I don't have a, a World of Darkness character on here. I played a bunch of World of Darkness, and um, for some reason, like none of those characters just really stuck out as you know my my A list. But yeah, I'm like four out of seven of these are Dungeons and Dragons, and the other ones are you know I got a Savage Worlds character, a couple other random things, Stormbringer. An apocalyptic character, you know, it's sprinkled around a little bit. There should also honestly be a fucking Star Wars character or two on here somewhere, but there's just not. Yeah, there would be a Star Wars character on my list if it was uh, more than just a playing through Order 66 in your game there, Jordan. <laughs> you know, I, I whenever I was making my list, there are characters that are in my distant memory that I wish I could recall more, because I do remember games like... One of my first long running game that I played in was a World of Darkness vampire game, and it started off Dark Ages and went to modern day. And I played a gang girl through the whole thing, and we went all the way again, and it was fun. But I just don't remember enough about the character. So, uh, but still, then you know, vampire was very much not like what we were talking about. Vampire, you definitely feel your power curve. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, it depends on what monster you're playing. If you're playing a human, I don't feel like humans really have much power curve. But if you're playing a fucking mage yeah you're gonna experience a huge yeah. power curve gang girls man they get nasty I mean, they all do the vampires i guess where we just played so long I, I i i took all my dots to to max almost and it that dude was a beast <laughs> i've got a gangrel on my list as well well tell me about him well my gangrel character is from it was named grit and uh i played him in the second edition vampire the masquerade as we were playing through the end times uh, adventure source book, whatever, um, back when um, old world of darkness was making way to new world of darkness. Um, it was the last adventure or supplement stuff that was coming out was all of their, the end of the world shit. And um, it had adventures for the different races of monsters and how they were interacting with the end of the world. So that was where that character's was in the world of darkness was at the very end. And I, I played through, um, the, uh, the coming of Gehenna in Columbus, Ohio with this character. Um, he was a gangrel. He was, um, let's see, he was born in the early, um, or in the 1920s and Became a soldier, fought in World War II in the Pacific, and then when he came home, got, um, got turned into a vampire, and so that was kind of his 
his background and he was very much the like your typical grand gangrel where he was very tough very menacing um i didn't have to i didn't have to use his um his active abilities too many times um that campaign was a i mean like a lot of vampire games um the campaign itself or the chronicle itself was a lot more um of social interaction and um so my character got to really bully other people a whole lot and if i pissed somebody off enough that they actually attacked me i had enough dots in um uh now i can't remember the the power set that allows you to just soak damage i had enough was it potence fortitude fortitude yeah i had enough dots in fortitude that i was just able to soak whatever i needed whatever most people could dish out uh another character i i did want to remind and now this is one of those i don't remember his name characters but i had a lot of fun and i think the main reason why i don't remember him is because it was another case of where i just kind of copied and pasted a celebrity or somebody i played so um i played a wizard again uh in a, a local buddy's game who uh and I, part of the reason why I wanted to mention it is because we've, it seems like a lot of the times we were talking about characters we took from point A to point B, and we went on the hero's journey, and, you know, that some big event happened. I liked this guy, and I liked this game, because he did the exact opposite. And I think I've talked about it a couple of times, just probably, I don't know if I mentioned it on the pod, but he just really got into designing this big town, and he just designed this town inside and out. And so he ran the game as more like a, a sandbox video game, and he... I mean, he literally didn't give us a story, and he told us that up front. He's like, I know everything that's going on in this town, but as far as making like some sort of narrative situation, I can get you guys into some shit, but it's going to be up to you. So given that, this guy was modeled after Aziz Ansari, the comedian, as a wizard who opened, but he was more his character from Parks and Rec, so he was this like slick guy that was always trying to, you know, get into, you know, trying to get, get rich. And he owned a potion shop, which turned out ended up being like the kind of like the headquarters for the group in downtime. That was our kind of home base. And I mean, the majority of the game was just me working business and like becoming a businessman in town. And I don't remember exactly how it didn't run that long, but it was just a lot of fun to just be given the keys to the game, you know, and have a DM that was that kind of confident in his setting that he could do that. And he pulled it off pretty well. Uh, had a lot of fun, but that character just not taking, you know, not taking the game very seriously, um, you know, trying to make, you know, find the comedy in it. And, you know, I think that my character was the one that if like combat happened, he was like running away like a pansy, you know what I mean? The idea of physical combat or violence, like he was not an adventurer at all. So like the majority of the time it was like, oh, I'm out and just like booking it, you know what I mean? And... I don't know. It just it worked, you know. Uh, the any uh any, as far as the non traditionals, uh, I, I don't know. Do you guys have anything that's not necessarily, uh, you know, we tried. You know, I played this character into the ground for years, and we accomplished some epic tasks. Is there a character that was just kind of lighthearted and just just fun to play? Well, I'm. Whenever you ask that question, I just come back to Wade the Wizard. Whenever you ask if I had a character who was just just a whole lot of fun to play. Um, I would say a second character that was just a whole lot of fun to play because um, most of my characters are very serious. I don't, I don't really do comedy characters very well. It just, my gaming style, I get, I've tried it a couple of times and I just get bored with it. And I, I only have a couple of characters who I could, who could conceivably take that, um, could could conceivably be called that but um the main character the, the extra character i was thinking of when you asked when you said that was um from jordan's apocalyptia game a couple years ago um seth big smile uh who was um i i tried to always have like some sort of just really charismatic funny thing to uh like dark humor to have in in situations and and my character was absolutely terrible of a person. He was he was scheming to take over the settlement where all of our characters lived, and um, 
I had the most detailed plan I have ever made for a character and how exactly I was going to take over the settlement. Um, unfortunately, that plan was never brought to fruition due to, uh, due to circumstances at the end of the campaign. But, um, he, Seth Big Smile was a character that I loved to get into, get into the head, get into the head space. And like, I feel like me playing that character, I, something switched in my brain where I was able to more often, more than I can, I can do in my everyday life. I was able to just come up with things to say off the cuff that were, I, I felt like were genuinely funny and just very genuinely quippy. Cause I'm, I'm really not that quippy of a person. And for some reason, this character, like this, the style of the character just, just synced so well in my mind that I was able to just channel this other this other mindset that allowed me to, to be this person. Did you ever pl have you guys ever enjoyed just thoroughly playing a character that all the other players hated, or at least maybe like a subset of the players, other players at the table just fucking loathed your character and you could feel it and they let you know that it was so fun to play. That's a fairly frequent thing in my experience. I think, um, <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, the Rick and Morty one comes to mind. I don't know if, I'm sure you don't remember it, but, uh, or maybe you do. I remember you telling me about a game you played once where you style, you and another player styled your characters after Rick and Morty specifically because I thought you did it. Who did that? No, that was Kyle. Yeah, that was Kyle. I, I ran the game and I gave, um, I gave the two Kyles, um, a couple of my old characters and they saw the characters and turned them into Rick and Morty. But wasn't it kind of specifically because a couple players just really hated Rick and Morty? The the third player in the group absolutely hated Rick and Morty. Um, Haley despises Rick and Morty, and the and by the end of that one shot session, I hated Rick and Morty also. <laughs> <laughs> the character that comes to my mind when I mentioned, asked the question was I, I played one of my very it was a very inexperienced role player. It was the first D and D game I ever played. I just read. Uh, I just read Dragonlance, and I basically just you know, played a kinder that was Tassel off Burfoot. And I played him to the hilt and just stole everything that I could. Every time we had downtime, I was constantly sending messages to the to the DM. Hey, I rolled a 20. What does such and such have in their backpack? You know, and I was just constantly stealing crap. And it, I, I mean, it was not too bad. It didn't derail too often. But man... The players got really sick of reaching for their like weapons and finding them in my backpack or something. Looking at the characters on your list, do you guys see any through lines? Like anything about anything that seems like it's a reoccurring thing about the characters that you hadn't really put a, put much notice in before? Like seeing something about the characters that. Um, it it wasn't something you intentionally done did, but you can definitely see that there is there is a there is your sp distinctive mark on the character that you hadn't noticed before. Yeah, I mean, I looking at my list, I noticed immediately. Now you, you probably have picked up on it too. I play wizards, and I've known that forever. I always play arcane casters if I can. I very rarely don't, and when I don't, I usually don't enjoy it. Um, uh, and I, I'm just not a super creative, apparently, because most of these characters on the list are just straight up copying real fictional or fictional characters from reality and just putting, dropping them into a game and playing them. I, I find that it, it helps me model the personalities. And as, I mean, they can grow and I change them over time, but a character I haven't mentioned so far. I played Deckard, a character modeled after Deckard from, uh, uh, you know, the movie, uh, Blade Runner. And, uh, you know, I've mentioned Data, I've mentioned Tasselhoff. Uh, it seems to be easier for me to just model my character's personalities after existing fictional people. It's a Deckard character in one of my Star Wars games. I can't remember. I think it was in one of your early days. I think it was either an early day Apocalyptia game when it was like a proto-Apocalyptia and you were still adapting. Uh, I think you were still even calling it World of Darkness. I thought for sure you played a character like that in a Rebels game that I ran at one time. And I may be confusing it, yeah. Huh. 
I haven't. That's why I don't remember much about the game. That's why I'm, I wrote it down, but I have hadn't planned on mentioning it because I really don't remember playing too much about it. I just kind of enjoyed being that character. I think that's really what led to the other character, Aldous, uh, being the private eye and being a private investigator. I, I enjoyed that kind of sleuth, gumshoe kind of uh, character. Um, when I'm looking at mine, this this isn't something that I, I haven't thought about at least a little bit before, but it's really clear to me now when I'm looking at this particular list. Um, I, I tend to make characters that have a very specific like concept to them in mind and build them to execute that thing as well as possible. And what I wind up with is, are these characters that are remarkably like self-sufficient. Like I see a bunch of characters here that any one of them on their own could be like the, the main character in a single player action video game. I don't make characters that give much of a fuck about the rest of the group. Apparently (laughs) I don't play a lot of like support characters or like, you know, just crowd control kind of guys or anything like that. Like you don't say, yeah, that's not a thing I give a shit about, man. I'm, I'm here for my fun first. Like, sorry people. See, I take the exact opposite approach though. I mean, I, I don't ever play. I never, ever make a character with that in mind. And I never, hardly ever think about where my character's going to go. I prefer to make a, you know, get an idea of where my character's at at the beginning and not, th- and maybe, you know, in your, everybody's backstory should be, you know, filled out enough to where they kind of know where that character wants to go. But then from there, I just let it rip. And I, I prefer to have weaknesses. I prefer not to be well-rounded. I, I, just because it makes you dependent on other players in a way, and it opens up good roles. I always see that as an opportunity to, like, it's like, I don't want to be good at healing because then I want to really appreciate my healer, you know? Mm-hmm. What about you, Clayton? Is there some personal theme you see in your characters? Um, the the theme of the from the initial onset of the character is I've got a lot of reluctant heroes. Um, but as far as the characters who made it onto my list of my favorite characters, the unifying theme is the character ended up not being exactly how I had envisioned it. Like as the, as the campaign unfolded, I had to make changes or I had to, I had to change the character concept in some way to be, um, either as a reflection of what happened to the character in the process of, of playing the game or um, in order to be more conducive to the group in which I was playing. Mm-hmm. I want to, I want to walk back something that I said, by the way, about, about my characters, because you guys ran each of you, one of the characters each on this list that are direct contradictions of what I just said. Um, in, in a sense. So one of them was Talon from the Savage Worlds game. Yes, for sure, that dude could fucking handle anything, whatever the fuck, but I spent a lot of time and effort intentionally taking a back seat and trying to push everybody else in the group as much as possible, um, when I could. That, that was a weird balancing act because the power differential was fucking dramatic uh in in terms of like dungeons and dragons i don't think it would have been like too ridiculous to say it was like five or ten level difference between what i could pull off with the spells that i had and what everybody else was capable of it's just like regular people um but the other one was uh this cleric atreus that was one of the earliest running games that i played um cleric of palor in uh Elliot's in a early Elliot campaign, man, that that was a lot of fun playing that guy. For one thing, I Elliot to, <laughs> to this day I kind of feel bad sometimes when I look back on that game about how much hell that I gave you, like arguing with deities and whatnot. Like I worked out a lot of childhood religious trauma in that game. <laughs> it did me a lot of good in retrospect, but uh, I, I I'm sure it was a gigantic pain in the ass the whole time. I just remember being completely outmatched in general. It was that first campaign that I ran as a kid, and 
it, I mean, it ran, I think, almost a year, definitely eight months. And I just remember being so stressed about it. I think I, I know that I worked harder on that game than I did on my ACT because it was about the same time. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure I scored horrible on the ACT because all I was worried about was being prepared for the next session. But uh, that character was really great. And I, lo- that, I look back on that game fondly. I, every player in that game, I think, developed a great attachment. That group had a great attachment. I know we're off on a tangent a little bit, but that's, that's what I do. So I have to share this session. Um, anytime I make a game or make a campaign, I kind of measure it against that campaign. And this one session in particular, it's the se- it's pro- now it's the second best session I've ever ran or been a part of as a DM. Um, and it was after a long pause. I had I'd reset the game. We'd done a long downtime. We all worked out what we'd been gone and, and doing. And one of the characters was the, the wife of one of, I mean, a friend, but she was, uh, her, she was married to one of the players older than us. And so her character at the end of the arc was pregnant. And so the, we began the, the beginning of the new arc at the birth of her, uh, child. And I remember that your character, Atreus, had the, one, maybe the best out of game role playing, uh, moments I've had in a game. Cause, I just remember, like, the whole party, the, we spent the whole session, everybody was freaking out about this and trying to, because she was in so much pain, she was just, you know, role-playing, like, being a pregnant lady, and I remember your character eventually got so worked up about not being able to help her that you cast the spell that shared her pain, and so you had this weird interaction as a player where, like, you kind of gave birth to her kid with her, and... <laughs> And it was, we never did roll, we didn't really roll any dice, and it was just t- setting the stage for the next chapter. But it was just so fun because you guys genuinely, like, role-played characters who had been, you not had much contact with each other for a long time. And you, I think everybody had, I think by that time your character had, during the downtime, became the art cleric of the town. You know, the wizard that was in the game had came back and had ascended to the arc mage of the academy and they were everybody had developed into these uh it was you know the into these high level you know, high status people and it was it was just a well ran it was real well ran and i think because all the players just gave a shit about their characters yeah and uh you know it's fun to find ways to use uh spells that are designed to just be combat stuff to do cool shit in role playing like that that third edition spell i can't remember what it's called um, but basically you, you point at somebody and as long as you keep the spell up there, you split the, any damage that they take evenly between you and them. That's all the spell says. But, you know, using that in a cool situation like that, I'm like, yeah, that's something that I'm going to remember for ages. I still have that character sheet. That's one of a handful of those that, you know, I kept and found. Yeah. That's the game, that's the game that I found the, uh, my entire binder for. Nice. Here's a thought. I don't know uh, if you were working on something over there, Clayton, but here's a question for you if, you, if you're if you dry. Uh, are there any characters that you've always wanted to play and you think would be really good and you just haven't had a chance to yet? Maybe a character concept or maybe even a character you made and the game just fizzled and you've never actually played it. Yes, I do have such characters. You can listen to episode 54, Greatest Characters Never Played, in order to oh. hear mine. <laughs> Going through this exercise, though, I, I, we have a care. I have a character I need to be making sometime in the next couple of weeks. I'm definitely gonna process all this and try to go out of my way to break some of these. Really think about whether or not I want to repeat some of my old habits. It's hard to get out of it. I've I've tried playing against you know my normal impulses, and you know that's that's usually when I wind up with something that I don't give a shit about, and I'm like, fuck, all right, we're a month in. Am I gonna bail on this guy? Like. I tried that with um, a game that Kyle ran, and uh, it was when I was thinking a lot about, like, man, I always wind up in this, like, leader role in the group, and, like, I'm sick of doing that. I'm going to pay, I'm going to play this character that absolutely can't be that. And so I came up with this character, uh, Clarence, who was a, a an absolute coward in everything that he did. And but he was a fucking badass with a crossbow, and so his whole thing was going to be like hiding, waiting, you know, sniping. And as soon as he, you know, gets up enough sack to actually fucking attack somebody, he takes off running and you know lets everybody else handle it. And he's just lost his nerve and 
shit his pants and you know I tried the whole bit tried like stuttering and like fucking up his words and like you know just being a complete wreck of a person and dude it went like what did I play that clay three weeks or something and I was like nah this is lame yeah well it, it was probably closer to four but I I do remember how Clarence uh, left the campaign um he just literally jumped ship and we never saw him again <laughs> we, were, we were sailing back to our home port and we got within sight of the city and he just jumped into the water and we don't know whether he survived or not. We were like within the harbor. He, he could have swam to shore. But yeah, like, I don't know. I, I've never been able to force it and, and have fun. I always just find myself like figuring out how to work my way back to that same kind of situation from like whatever fucked up beginnings that I have with this weird character. This is where I often get envious of uh, you guys being able to maintain the length of your role-playing habit. I've just, you know, I've got either very recent characters or very old characters on the list because I, I stepped away for so long. Uh, you know, I definitely enjoyed a recent game, but it was really a good example of, A, why you should uh, be moderate in, in all of your uh, in-game act, in-game uh, festivities. Because uh, there was a couple, but I played a wizard, a really high-level wizard, 20th-level wizard. It was meant to be a short ran campaign, and I enjoyed it way too much. <laughs> I mean, I it's one of those games where he was, I let my id go so out of control being a 20th-level wizard. I mean, you're, you're essentially a god that, I don't know, I think I ran a little too rough shot over the game and the other players, and... It uh, didn't last very long because uh, I just made a mockery of the whole thing. But uh, at, at, sometimes you can have too much fun and enjoy your characters a little too much. <laughs> just because it's fun for you doesn't mean it's fun for everybody else. Yeah, for sure. One of the characters that um, I, I can kind of feel you on that with, Elliot, is uh, Clayton years ago ran, a, um, ran an Apocalyptia game. Um, so I decided to, uh, play this character, Ethan, who was modeled off of, uh, a buddy of mine who's a militant communist. And I was like, all right, what, what would happen if you had somebody who their whole life was like kind of self-indoctrinating as like a full on fucking commie and then the world fell to shit? And this dude could just kind of do whatever the fuck he felt was right. Holy shit, did I become a monster. <laughs> and it didn't help that um, one of our main antagonists was this uh, this gang of, like, Aryan Brotherhood type of people. So, like, I remember at one point, um, this was set in, like, West Virginia, right? And uh, we we had... We had caught a bunch of them on a bridge somehow, and it was kind of like, they were kind of like boxed in or whatever, and um, we were like really, really powerful at that point. We geared up, we had like sick weapons, we got good at our skills, and we had a pretty solid lay of the land, and we wound up, you know, winning in this, this battle and captured a bunch of them, and... Uh, Whoa, 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 whoa. It's very generous calling the, the slaughter that ensued a battle. Well... Let me let me explain how I dealt with the POWs. <laughs> um, so we we had a bunch of them. I don't know, maybe like a dozen or something. Uh, and uh, we we had this kind of circle of cars that was pushed together that was like holding them all in there, right? And uh, you know, I was like standing there with a gun, like nobody could do anything. They're completely disarmed. And I was like, what the fuck are we going to do with these guys? As soon as I turn my back for a second, like, they're going to try to, you know, get out of their ropes or whatever. Um, fucking kill somebody in their sleep. These guys are a huge liability. These are, like, murdering bastards. So I was like, all right. I, <laughs> I tossed him a knife. And I said, whichever one of you survives gets to go free. <laughs> and Clayton decided, all right. <laughs> There's a fucking battle royale where these dudes are just tearing themselves apart to be the last dude who's still breathing at the end of this fucking thing. Um, I, I pretty much became a war criminal, like, pretty rapidly. And it seemed like a natural, 
like evolution at every stage. <laughs> you kind of became Negan. Yeah. It was all for the greater good, you know? I mean, somebody's exactly. got to deal with this bad element. Clayton, what did you think when I came up with that idea? Well, it, I was, I was shocked that, that you suggested it. And then that, uh, then when nobody did anything to prevent this from happening, it was just a case of, okay, this is the road we are going down. And, uh, I, I fully engaged in allowing you to be as much of a monster as you were going to become. And literally the only thing that, um, I left in the world to really keep you in check was the other player characters. <laughs> and they really didn't do that didn't too, so fun. much, did they? Not a single one of them gave a shit. <laughs> oh God. But at that at that point, the characters had had some uh, some shit happen to them. Um, some of the characters had been um, had been uh, literal slaves. Um, some of them had um, been rescued from basically just being chattel. Yeah, everybody was highly traumatized, and uh, I don't know. That was sociologically speaking, that was one of the most interesting parts of that game for me because I was I was aware of what was going on. I wasn't like you know, just unconsciously devolving into a fucking mass murder. And multiple times through that game, I, I kept thinking, are they going to let me do this? <laughs> well, they let me do that last thing. What about this? <laughs> I'll tell you, I've been in that situation where I've had the character who is designed to be a monster. And if you don't talk about it ahead of time with the other player characters, they're just going to either not say anything or they'll be just in stunned silence and too <laughs> uncomfortable to do anything to stop you. <laughs> I have one character on my list who the first time I played this character, it was literally that situation where this character ended up being just too much of a monster. And I, I had told the other player characters, Hey, this guy is a bad guy. I want to play an arc where he becomes a good guy. And we play like maybe three sessions of this game. And um, my character was a full-blooded orc. And he was coming from orc society. And the types of solutions I was coming up to problems we were facing were the types of things that you would automatically assume and orc would come up with as a solution to problems usually murder and rape and i ended up having to like i i ended up having to uh shelve the character for this campaign and play a different character and i eventually played this character in a diff in another campaign years later where i worked it out with another player from session one hey um you're is it cool if we play um, these two characters where my character is is a bad guy who um, your character is reforming? I had to specifically work it out with one specific other player that yes, this is this is the responsibility part of the responsibility of playing your character is keeping my character in line. Mm -hmm. So this this kind of leads into a question that I was just thinking about. Um, what what characters for you were the biggest disappointments in that you were excited to play it, you might have put a lot of work into it, and then you got to it, and then if be it, you know, because it just didn't work out or because, you know, something in the game, other players, the DM, whatever, um, it, it things just didn't come together the way that you wanted. Would that be one of those characters for you? If I had never had a second opportunity to play that character, that character would definitely have been that. Um, the character's name was Marsky. Um, I, I put a lot of effort into him front loading him, uh, for what he was going to be doing. And then the first time I tried him, he just, he just, uh, was impossible to play in that campaign. Mm -hmm. Do you want to, you have any other things you want to go over? Um, do you want to talk any about just campaigns that, campaigns that you've DM'd that just stick out as a high watermark in the way that um, 
your your favorite characters have always stuck in your mind? Do you have any campaigns that have just stuck out in your mind? Yeah, there's a there's a couple that stick out for me. There were two Star Wars games that I ran briefly mentioned earlier. Um, one of them was uh, a um, Rebel era game, uh, like you know early formation of the Rebel Alliance, like many years prior to Episode Four, kind of um, kind of game that ran for quite a while. I had a lot of fun with that. The players were super engaged. I was super engaged. Um, yeah, I, I still have the binder for that game, and I had every fucking square meter of that group ship mapped out on graph paper. And uh, yeah, that was that was a pretty great one. The other Star Wars game was a um, Jedi game uh, several centuries prior to the movies um, where the the group were were all Jedi Knights who were hunting down um, this rogue dark Jedi who'd formed a cult um, on this planet and they crash landed on this planet um, pursuing these guys and uh, I I put a lot of work into all of the acolytes of this uh, this dark lord. There was a, a ton of like philosophical debate about the nature of the force and all this kind of stuff. Um, it was it was almost that um, that like uh, Castle Ravenloft like periodic encounters with Strahd, you know, kind of situation where they they would like get to learn a little bit about this dude and then he you know, skip out somehow, and, you know, a, a few of them were, like, definitely starting to turn to the dark side, and it's got, it's got some points, you know, so that was, that was a lot of fun, um, I, I think probably the most involved I've ever seen players in a game that I've run is that Apocalyptic Factions game that Seth Big Smile was in, um, I don't think that I've ever, uh, ran a campaign that I've seen evoke so much emotion out of the players. Um, like, actual felt emotion, not like feigned acted emotion. <laughs> that one, that one's going to stick out with me forever, I think. Yeah, I will forever remember the cry of despair when Haley's character got killed. Oh my god, I thought someone was going to call the police. <laughs> One of the highlights of my role playing career right there, Clayton. <laughs> oh my god. That was good. What about you? What are your uh, what are your favorite games that you run? Um, I've got two as well. One of them is another one that we've already talked about on the podcast, the Abana game. Um we can you can if you wanna hear more about that, you can check out episodes four and twenty five of the podcast. And I'm trying to find the episodes, the specific episode where we, uh, where Haley learned who actually killed her character because that, that's one of the early episodes. And, uh, if you want to hear, a a little bit about, uh, how emotional all of us got during the course of the campaign, uh, that would be an episode to go back to, but I can't seem to just looking at the names. I can't remember which episode it was. Um, I may have to add, I may have to splice something in later. Yeah. All right, so after the episode was finished, I went back to try to find the thing that I had just referenced, talking about Haley learning about how her character from the Apocalyptia Factions game was killed. It turns out that our discussion was never actually released for the podcast. Uh, we talked in one particular episode, episode five, we talked about Jordan's system of Apocalyptia, and I cut that episode off uh, before we actually got into talking about that particular faction's game. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be uh, publishing that content on Patreon as a bonus episode. I will release it for free on Patreon at patreon.com slash alien familiar media. Um, the other campaign is was one of the well it was literally the first campaign that i had ever run as a from with a start to finish story arc that was a back in college um i ran a planescape game where my players were um 
Well, I told them at the onset that there is no expectation that your characters have to be heroes in this campaign. And then I told them, by the way, I will be making your characters for you, and all of your characters will start with amnesia. So the first session, the amount of information I, that I have just given you is the total sum information that the players had about this game that they were going to be playing. And I remember just seeing all of the players' faces light up as they get their monstrous characters where Beth is playing a, um, um, a fairy, which is a, um, like basically the, um, the child of a succubus. And another player was playing a, um, a half dragon who was wearing the, um, the hide of his mother as he you know, turned into plate mail armor. <laughs> and another player, another player was playing a changeling or a, a, a no, not a changeling. This was before that. It was playing a full doppelganger, so had all of those abilities that a doppelganger has. And uh, another player, to his surprise, was playing a character who he had just previously played the previous year, who the character had gone bad and started committing atrocities, and we turned him... like he basically stopped playing the character in the campaign because the character had started committing atrocities. So he was, re he was given this character that he had um, been told was irredeemable and had to stop playing because he, the character was so evil. And I remember over the course of the campaign, there were a lot of, there were a lot of moments that I could tell like just how invested everybody was, but Every time I think back about like my favorite gaming moments, I remember this one moment toward the end of the campaign and the look of the look on the faces of all of the other players when one of the characters gave a revelation um, about this paladin character who they had all like had a little bit of a run in with. And the character revealed, oh, um, this this paladin character, um, this was Beth's character, the the descendant of a succubus. Um, this character was my husband when I was alive. I remember just the the look of dumbfound, um, just dumbstruck um, surprise on all of the players' faces. And then when the paladin walks in and asks them for help or asks them for help with something, another player just straight up said. Do not trust this paladin. I had them in the course of this campaign. I had them so turned around that <laughs> they were unwilling to believe the word of a, not only a paladin, but this character had died and come back as an angel. So he <laughs> literally had a halo over his head as he was talking to them. And I had another player saying, do not trust this guy. We can't trust him. <laughs> if you can't trust an angel, who can you trust? So that that one moment is probably that that one session where all of that stuff went down is probably one of my greatest one of my greatest memories and I consider one of my greatest accomplishments as a DM. And that was pretty early in my DM career as well. Nice. Ah. I'm I feel like I'm kind of spent on on talking about characters and campaigns. You want to go ahead and do geek things, or do you have anything else you want to do? Uh, I think I've burned through all of them that I can recall at the moment. I'm sure, like always, three or four of them are going to pop back up to the top after this is over with, but whatever. All right. Um, I'll go ahead and start the geek things. Um, I've only got really one geek thing. Um, it is a YouTube channel called um, Todd in the Shadows. Um, he does a lot of music reviews, but he has uh, two series that he is doing um, in addition to his uh, music reviews. Um, one of them is called Train Records, where he talks about just abysmal records, like records that pretty much like either did or came very close to completely obliterating very popular artists' careers. Like he talks about, like um, I don't remember the name of it, but Madonna made a, an absolute trash record um, in the early 2000s. It talks of the first episode that I listened to was about um, Metallica's Saint Anger album, <laughs> um, talking a, a lot about these albums that either did or just came very close to completely uh, uh, 
having bands commit career suicide. The other series that he does is called One Hit Wonderland, and it's basically the opposite of Train Records, where he talks about bands who had one hits and the bands themselves are absolutely fascinating and talking about who they were why this why they caught the cultural zeitgeist in 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 at just the right time to have this one hit wonder and why why they couldn't follow it up and why why nobody knows of anything else that they have ever done and why a lot of them just dropped into absolute obscurity after their one hit. So for my geek things, I got a couple of things here. Um, one of them is an app that I recently found called Space Launch Schedule, and it gives you all of the upcoming space launches all around the world, and you can you know filter for whatever area. I um I happen to be lucky enough to be able to see a lot of these firsthand these days, so it is invaluable to me. But if you're not living that close it's also got links to watch all of these space launches live online which is pretty cool and it's got you know notifications all the stuff you'd expect out of a, a good app um but yeah it's the best way i've found to stay plugged into what's going on in space these days um on a related note i recently watched this uh new netflix movie uh stowaway about a crew going to mars on one of the first mars missions and uh finding out that there's somebody aboard they weren't expecting and that leads to a lot of trouble and it's a pretty great movie um imdb really shit on it for some reason i don't know why maybe it's because amazon owns imdb but uh i liked it it's very like rigorous hard sci-fi like probably even more so than the martian i'd say um so yeah, still away. That was a pretty good one. Um, and the other thing, I'm a little late to the game on this, but I just wrapped up uh, season one of HBO's True Detective, and I'm just thrilled. Um, if if you haven't caught it, catch it. I hear the season two and three are maybe not so great, but uh, yeah, Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson just fucking killed it on that show. So yeah, check that out if you haven't already. Yeah, I've I've checked out season one. Absolutely loved it. Started season two, didn't get into it, never finished it, and never even tried season three. I heard season three is a little bit better, but I just didn't want to put anything into I've it. I've heard the same. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. But yeah, as far as like, you know, Cthulhu y like, you know, even X Files y type of shit like that, that scratched an itch that I've had for a while now. Absolutely. I'm struggling this week, but I got one for you. Um, for me, uh, I was just going to recommend uh, some music software I've used for a long time uh, called Reaper. Uh, I like to make uh, make a little music uh, as a hobby. And uh, for anybody who needs uh, a fully functioning workstation that can make high quality music on the cheap, I highly recommend giving Reaper a try. Um, it, it can give any of the big names are run for their money and it's free to download and gives you full access. And if you decide to, you know, purchase it all out, just out of the kindness of your heart, it's only 60 bucks. So anybody who's interested in, you know, just doing anything with audio. Um, but especially if you like to like to make music at your house, I highly recommend Reaper. Thank you. Well, Jordan, why do you say we stop this bullshit and start rolling some dice? Hey. This has been a production of Alien Familiar Media. You can find past episodes and more at alienfamiliar.com. You can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com. This production is protected under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution, no derivatives license. Music for this episode is Suburban Outlaw by Forget the Whale and can be found at freemusicarchive.org.